the Quran, the holy book of Islam. Some people respect it, others despise it, others don't even know anything about it. And there's other people that have limited it and don't find it necessary or don't find the needs for it in our modern societies today. Yet, the holy month of Ramadan is the month where this divinely revealed book was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Yet, we find Muslims not having the relation with this divinely revealed book. The Word of God, a lot of people have limited these divinely revealed books or this, these divinely revealed words to only weddings, funerals, and to this holy month. For me personally, I feel and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me more time to actually get to ponder upon the verses of the Quran, to read more, to learn more. And unfortunately, we see people who even on the Quran have differentiated. A person said, I have a different idea on this verse. A person says, I have a different idea on the other verse. And yet, we have not come united to recite this book on a daily basis. Now, how do we get to understand the words of wisdom that are within this book? This is why we have Dr. Sayyid Ammar al-Naqshwani joining us tonight to discuss mm. Quran in the holy month of Ramadan. Respected viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Very well, thank Allah you. Uh, now, Sayyidina, a lot of people have abandoned this book. Many as I mentioned, don't find it necessary in our societies today. They find different excuses to actually even open the book. It's collecting dust on the shelves. It's unfortunate to see that. Something natural, I think, in the human being that it's not easy for them to relate to texts which were from over a thousand years back. Mm -hmm. I don't expect people to have an affinity with the Quran or with the Bible or with the Torah or with the Gita or any of the sacred scriptures of the other religions. I don't expect them to have the love and passion come overnight for these pieces of literature. I can't say that I'm somebody who in his teens could not wait to read the Holy Quran. Yeah. And nor do I think many of my Christian brethren or my Jewish brethren or my Hindu brethren or my Sikh brethren while they respect their holy books, I don't think that they'll say that they are books which they look forward to reading. Yes, maybe on a Friday we all get together. Maybe on a Saturday we'll get together. Maybe on a Sunday we'll get together, whether it's at the mosque or at the church or at the synagogue, to try and maintain that relationship with our holy books. Yes. But I can't deny that these aren't books that it's easy for one to have a particular affinity to unless in one way or the other they are inspired by someone who's an expert in them who makes the book suddenly become real in their lives or by them actually reflecting on the, the odd verse once a day or reading the odd chapter once a week mm -hmm. now if you look within the religion of Islam the Quran has a verse which highlights that the community of the Prophet sadly will abandon and has abandoned the Quran. It's mentioned. Mentioned. As in, if some of us think that we've abandoned the Quran and this is something which is a new phenomenon. On the contrary, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, has this very interesting verse in chapter 25, verse 30 of the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. Where it begins, قَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, actually cries out, My Lord, my people have abandoned this Quran. They have abandoned this book. It hurts the Muslim when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, cries in anguish at any moment. But this is a verse of unbelievable amount of emotion and sentiment from the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. That when he's calling out, Ya Rabbi inna qawmi Quran mahjura, that my people have abandoned this Quran, he's in a way not just telling us one of the cries of anguish on the day of judgment, nor just one of the cries of anguish, for example, in his own life, but also is highlighting to us 
that, hey guys, don't be of those who I complain about or the Quran complains about on the Day of Judgment. Because there are a number of traditions which highlight about those who complain on the Day of Judgment. Yes. And there's one tradition which I must admit shook me in my life. Mm -hmm. And I hope that it has an effect on the viewers Hopefully. and has an effect on all of us every day in our life. Mm -hmm. Three will complain about the way that they were abandoned mm -hmm. on the Day of Judgment. Number one. The first, our mosques. Yeah. Our mosques, sadly, there is something creeping into our community where online majalis has now taken over attending the mosque. I don't want to say that I'm responsible. Hopefully, hopefully they're sitting watching us. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't mind them yeah. coming and sitting to watch us. You yeah. can watch us. There's no issue whatsoever. Yeah. But I don't think we could deny that online lectures, online yeah. seminars have meant that a lot of people have begun to abandon. Mm -hmm. The mosques that were built with the hard work and the sweat of the elders of the community. Today it's normal for someone when it's a wilada of an imam of Ahlul Bayt or a shahada, you'll find them saying, you know what, I'd rather stay at home and watch this online. Firstly, you're missing out the social significance yes. of the gathering. Secondly, our spiritual belief of the attendance of the imam of Ahlul Bayt salam, when it comes to these gatherings. But thirdly, it's never the same when you're at home. When you're at home, the phone rings, you've just missed a part of that segment. All of a sudden, for example, someone's called you, the kids are crying. So therefore, you find sometimes in our mosques today, they've been abandoned. People will turn up in Muharram, they'll turn up in the holy month of Ramadan. But if you tell someone on a wet Tuesday night in London or a snowy Wednesday night in Toronto, that it's the Shahada of Imam al-Jawad, They'll be like, listen, buddy, Muharram, I'll turn up. Yeah. 21st, 23rd Ramadan, I'll turn up. But as for me turning up, for example, in these nights, you know what? I'd rather stay at home. So, number one, the mosque will complain about the way we decorated them, but yes. there wasn't that energy inside them. them. Yeah. Number two, number the two. family of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Key. They'll complain about our treatment towards them. Have we written books in their honor? Have we built hospitals with their names? Today we had the honor of visiting Imam Al-Hujjah, Ajal Allah Faraj Al-Sharif's yes. hospital in Karbala. Yes. And the fantastic work that is being undertaken in that hospital in the Holy Land of Karbala, a hospital that everybody should try and support, which is looking after not just the followers of Ahlul Bayt, but the name of Ahlul Bayt as, as a force for good in the world. Ahlul Bayt salam, we can write books in their name, we can build orphanages in their name, we can dedicate chairs and institutions of education in their yes, name. Of course. That's us not abandoning the cry, Hal min Nasr and Yansurna, for example. So therefore you have number two, Ahlul Bayt salam, may complain about the way we've neglected them. But number three, the Holy Quran. Wow. That book that sits amongst us here, look how beautiful this book is in the middle of both of us. But there's a reality. And the reality is that many people will not open this book throughout the year. Unfortunately. Many will not reflect on the wonderful words of the Quran. I don't know if you remember, mm -hmm. a few years ago, I had this lecture series on the sciences of the Quran. We called mm -hmm. it the abandoned Quran. And in that lecture series, do you remember when I said, name me the first 10 surahs of the Holy Quran? <laughs> if you were to ask over 80% of the Muslim world, to name you the first 10 surahs of the Holy Quran. And if I were to ask you, and I ask the lads over here, and I ask the guys behind the camera, and I were to ask many in the community to name the first 10 surahs of the Holy Quran, and I'm gonna ask you, you're not getting away with it. Name me the ten, first 10 surahs of the Holy Quran, Hajj Ahmed, Ali al Astarabadi. Go ahead. Uh, well, number one, Al Fatiha. Fatiha, number al two, Baqarah, Baqara. number al -Amran. three, Al Amran, al number four. Nisa, Nisa, number five, Al number six, uh, An'am, An number seven, Araf, Ar 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 excellent, number eight, number eight. Anfal, excellent, number nine, At excellent, number ten, Yunus, excellent, MashaAllah, good, I tell you, if you were not married, I would be telling people to send proposals right now because that is amazing.
mm. that you got eight out of ten. Well done. I'm proud eight of you. Eight. That eight. is amazing. There are many out there. The moment they get Fatiha, Baqarah, Al Imran, after Al Imran, it's like ah, uh, uh, Maida, uh, oh, what, what's Anfal, An Am? What are you talking about, An Am? You know, and, and that's a sad situation in the Muslim yeah. Ummah. It is. Someone might say, who cares if you don't know the names of the chapters of the Holy Quran? When you have not understood the index of the chapters of the Holy Quran, then you've not understood what a holistic book the Holy Quran is. The Holy Quran is not a historical narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not beginning with, for example, hey, let's have the first chapter about, for example, Adam and Eve, and the last chapter will be about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. On the contrary, when you're looking at the Holy Quran, you find that there are chapters on the natural world, the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. There are chapters about great personalities. There are chapters about great women. There are chapters about different tribes. The galaxies. The ga there are chapters about everything, the cosmological, the metaphysical, the psychological. Yeah. All of these areas are discussed in the Holy Quran. When you look at the first 10 chapters, Hajj Ahmed, mm -hmm. Al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, the opening. Yes. The second, the cow. The third, the family of Imran. Imran. The fourth, woman. The fifth, the holy supper. The sixth, cattle. The seventh, the elevated heights. The eighth, the spoils. The ninth, repentance. The tenth, Jonah. You're seeing that this is a remarkable, remarkable, um, what one may call diversity in the way God wants to speak to humanity. When people say the Quran was the last word of God, sometimes people turn around and say, why is that book the last word of God? Because the previous books may have been historical narratives with wonderful ethical moments. Mm -hmm. But this one book has now looked at the holistic, the spiritual, the legal, the ethical, the theological is all included within it. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier that, you know, it's a 1400 year old book and it's hard for people to keep up with it or, you know, have a relationship with it. But then you mentioned how significant it is in our societies. And a lot of people, you know, I think they're, they're not getting the way that, at the Quran, the, 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 they, the way they should be. Now, why should we as Muslims have a relation with this book? We as Muslims have to have a relationship with this book because our world view mm -hmm. is to be directed through God's divine words mm -hmm. this book is not a normal book this is the words of the Lord of the heavens and the earth this is what allows us to maintain that relationship with the heavens yes there are many authors fiction and non-fiction in this world mm -hmm. they're human beings they're fallible beings these are the words of the Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God in the Quran doesn't just call it the Quran it's not just about being recited it's not just about being read. One of the words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for the Holy Quran is the dhikr. Remembrance. Ahsant. The reminder. The reminder. Have you ever had a moment in your life, you're about to do something, an eye of the Quran pops in your head? Yes. Many times. Like the amount of times that you backbite, for example. Say it in the Doni. No, not you, not you. I mean, generally. Ha, Doni. No, no, no way you, no way you. But. <laughs> <laughs> the, you look in the Holy Quran, the moment you're about to backbite, Allah. you know, I just front bit, I didn't ah, backbite. Okay. So wow. the moment you are about to backbite, if the Quran is a book which truly you have built a relationship with, mm -hmm. and it's a book which becomes a reminder to you, the moment you're about to backbite, you remember, well, I have to come back and do not backbite one another. Sometimes you're thinking, I want to spy on what the neighbors have, are building. Are they building a small shed in their backyard? Are they, for example, extending the house? As you're about to look, the ethical construct of the Quran pops in your head. Wow. Someone's told you, you know that Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani? I heard this and that about him. One side of you will say, yeah, is that true? Do you think that's really true? The ethical side when you've built a relationship with the Quran, it becomes a reminder for you. And you remember the words, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ijtanibu kathiran min al-dhan, inna ba'da al-dhan ni'ith. Oh, you who believe, stay away from suspicion. Suspicion sometimes can be a sin. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes you're about to make fun of a group of people. Mm -hmm. How? How? You're about to make fun of a whole nation. And I know we, we've made fun of you a lot in the last two weeks. <laughs> and so therefore, on my part, that verse, they don't <laughs> pop up straight away. But if you look, for example, as you're about to make fun of a nation, then you'll find a verse will pop up in your head. Yes. The moment that happens, the Quran acts as a reminder for you in your life. Number two. Number two. Some of us spiritually feel down. Yes. Let's not deny it, whether it's me, whether it's you. Our spirituality is in peaks and troughs. Yes. Sometimes we're buzzing. Sometimes we just can't be bothered for anyone. Sometimes we're dying to go to the mosque. Sometimes we want to stay away from the mosque. Sometimes we're in the best mood. Sometimes we're in the worst moods. The Quran is a shifa for the chest of the human being. When it says shifa al sudur, what does it mean? It means that it's able to provide us with a remedy for our spiritual illnesses. Yes. When we're feeling moments when we're down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell us, أذكروني أذكركم. أذكركم, yes. Remember me, I'll remember you, don't worry. As long as there's a bit of remembrance on me, then I'll come and I'll remember you. You mm -hmm. take a step towards me, my dear creation. I'll take 10 back towards you. Wow. Those moments when I have a relationship with the Quran, when I see my Lord's telling me, remember me and I'll remember you. When I am wondering, how can I, for example, get a state of joy and jubilation while I'm in a state of sadness? My Lord tells me, let in shakartum, let azidannakum. Be thankful for the amount that I've given you. Don't worry, I'll give you more. Wow. When I therefore look at these ayahs, sometimes I'm feeling really depressed at home. Things aren't going well for me. I need a pat on the back. Then I see God say to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, Don't let their words grieve you. Even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, their words would grieve him. Allah says, don't let their words grieve you. Don't worry. Likewise with us, when we are down because people have attacked us or something's gone wrong in our marriage or someone's gone wrong in our relationship or something's gone wrong in our business and the people are talking and talking and talking, we remember the word. Don't let their words grieve you. When you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're already wealthy. Therefore, number two, the Quran is not just a, a reminder, but the Quran also becomes a cure for all our illnesses. Yes. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the secret is you reflecting on the words of the Quran. Mm -hmm. You want, when you're facing a trial or a tribulation, just contemplate over my words. Yes. Do they not ponder over this Quran? Or are their hearts sealed? I want my heart on the day of judgment to be a heart which is pure, to be a heart which is at peace. Because that day, I don't want there to be a qufl, a lock on my heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tadabbur on the Quran, just sit. And my dear brothers and sisters, one eye of the Quran a day. Don't do more than that. Start off with one eye, because I know some people say, you know what, I'm going to read a chapter of the Quran a day and I'm going to have a relationship with the Quran. Mm -hmm. One eye a day, mm -hmm. see the change. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Lina Jabbar from Toronto, she says, what's the simplest way to be a member of the Quran and you just mentioned that. Just one ayah. One way is for example to listen to my 114 lectures titled The Hidden Quran. 114 lectures. I, I, you know what, I had to throw that in. I'm sorry everyone, I know it's cheesy. But it's available on iTunes. 114 lectures, half an hour on each chapter of the Holy Quran. Wow. Why was the verse, why was the chapter revealed? When was it revealed? What happened when it was revealed? 114. That. And you know what, guys, we, what else do you want us to do? As in, we've done this production, 114 surahs of the Holy Quran. You can play it in your car when you drive. Play it in the car. Half an hour? Today in the car, what's the name of those artists you said people play in the car? I don't know. Jay-Z and no. uh, Sheikh Drake and Sheikh Drake. Uh, what's the other one? Dr. Dre. And uh, Dr. Dre and Drake and, and, and who? Ah, I say and all these names, yes. for example. 
No, why not play a reminder of the Holy Quran? These are half an hour lectures. That's a way in which you build a relationship with the Quran. Or start a Quran circle amongst your friends. Some of the guys in our community, they're brilliant at coming together to play football and basketball and, you know, and other sports. Okay. Seven, 10, 15 of them will get together. Why not try once a week or once a month to have a gathering? And that gathering, you get the Holy Quran and all of you sit and you reflect on the words of the Holy Quran. Mm. I remember, and the boys in London who are watching this will remember, when we began al Harak al Haidariya, we began that movement in London in the year 2000 to try and bring all the youth together for us to reflect on the teachings of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt Every Friday night, sometimes on Tuesday nights, we'd get together, pick a sword of the Quran and try as much as possible to reflect upon it. Many of those youths went on to become leaders of the community. Others went on to become speakers in the community. Others, I'm sure it's helped them in their relationships, in their life or in their studies as well. So try and all of you get together and hopefully in these gatherings, you'll be able to reflect on the Quran. Mm -hmm. Now, going into the historical uh, incidents that happened in the Quran, when was it exactly revealed? Because a lot of people have different opinions on it. We have two concepts in Islam. Mm -hmm. Revelation and there's the gradual revelation. Revelation as a whole? Revelation as a whole and then gra and gradual revelation. Uh -huh. The words are Inzal and Tanzil. On the 27th of Rajab, the Quran was revealed gradually, step by step, to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. I know that there are many people who celebrate the 27th of Rajab because they believe that the Mi'raj of the Holy Prophet took place yes. on the 27th of Rajab. The 27th of Rajab is more significant actually for the Mab'ath of the Prophet, Mab for the, the beginning of the Bi'atha, the beginning of the prophethood in terms of the announcement in public of the Prophet Muhammad's message. Yes. Peace be upon him and his family. Yes. That's when the chapter of Iqra was revealed. Someone asked the question, if the 27th of Rajab is when the Quran and the chapter of Iqra was revealed, then how comes we read in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 185, Yes. Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila feehim Quran, hudan lil nasi wa bayinatim min al huda wal furqan. The holy month of Ramadan, you know, it, the Ahlul Bayt tell us don't say Ramadan, say Shahru Ramadan. Why? For Ramadan is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say the holy month of Ramadan. Alladhi unzila feehi al Quran. Now, if it's saying it's revealed in Shahar Ramadan, so what was Rajab? What was Shahar Ramadan, Laylat al Qadr, in that month, the whole Quran is revealed into the heart of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. All of it. All of it. As the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family, continues to spread his message. The verses are revealed on a gradual manner so the people can develop slowly and gradually. If for example, let me give you an example. If you now have the whole Quran revealed to the heart of the Prophet and he gives it to everyone, says, hey, everyone read it. No one can relate to it. If however, when the companions run away on the day of Uhud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then reveals a portion وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولُ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ عَقَابِكُمْ can you relate to it more? Because it's just been revealed at that moment. Yes. There's no contradiction. It's as if I'm putting the hard drive in your heart. Nice but for the benefit of the nascent Muslim community, we're going to do what? We're going to reveal the Quran right. step by step. No contradiction between the two. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, the moment an incident occurs, straight away from the heart, for example, he already has it stored, therefore when he recites it, it's recited in perfection. Mm -hmm. There is no error in the recital whatsoever. Jibra'il will come with revelation at different moments. For example, an incident occurs 
when that incident occurs, Allah reveals an ayah of the Quran. Does that mean the Prophet Muhammad is the first time he hears the ayah? Already it's in his heart. Uh -huh. It's a matter now of him, simply what's in his heart now has been revealed to him. He now announces it to the public. Before this, the public was not privy to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. I just have a side question. Sure, go ahead. So if, if the Prophet did know all of this, then, I mean, did know the Quran, all of it was revealed, then what's the point of Jibra'il coming, descending upon him and revealing something? If he, he, he will know the future and he knows the Quran, so he just mentions the ayah as something happens. Jibra'il comes with guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell him this is the moment for this ayah now to be said to the people. Wouldn't he know that or no? Sometimes Jibra'il will come. Other times it doesn't have to be Jibra'il. He himself knows when there's a moment for that revelation to be given. He would talk about that I know the wahi is now about to be announced when there's a sudden feeling of a weight on him. Quran says, Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We are giving you a heavy weight. Sometimes he would hear a noise which would tell him that this is now when an ayah is to be revealed. But Jibra'il, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is programmed in perfection. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, the malaika have a role. They have a relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Therefore, Jibra'il alayhi salam is not going to be present at every single moment there's a revelation. Sometimes no. Sometimes there's a feeling in the heart of the Prophet Muhammad where he will say the revelation there and then. Yeah. Sometimes Jibra'il's presence comes to provide with the guidance because even sometimes in the Holy Quran, I remember an ayah in Surah Hud. There's an ayah where it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, that don't worry about the message you're going to give them. If you're hesitant to give it now, don't worry, go ahead and give it. In other words, there was always a constant guidance with him as the Quran was being revealed to the people. Mm -hmm. Now, did the Prophet become hilarious when he was revealing the Quran or when, or when he was you know, telling the people about the verses and, and incidents or no? This sadly is in Islamic literature, it is. but in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we completely reject this. Mm -hmm. Those who say that when the Prophet Muhammad received his first revelation, he went into a fit and hysterical and he wanted to commit suicide. I have a whole lecture on the internet called the hysterical epileptic. Yeah. And that lecture looks at all these traditions that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, wanted to jump off the mountain and wanted to commit suicide and how in the school of Ahlul Bayt and Shi'i thought, we completely reject these traditions. Mm -hmm. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, already knew he was a prophet of God. If Jesus can know that he's a prophet of God, when? From the cradle. From the cradle. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, family, does not know he's a prophet of God. The Prophet Muhammad knows he's a prophet of God. He was simply waiting for when the time would be where the announcement from the heavens tells him that now go out and recite the words of your Lord. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those who try and mention that the Prophet Muhammad suddenly fell in a fit of hysteria, we completely reject this opinion. Mm -hmm. We even reject this opinion that the Prophet Muhammad required confirmation from Khadija's cousin Waraka bin Nawfal that yes, you are a prophet of God, I'm the one who's telling you. Not at all. The Prophet Muhammad, years before he was a prophet in public, had already amongst his community, those who were very close to him had already known that he is the messenger of God. Mm -hmm. Of them Abu Talib, of them Ali son of Abu Talib, yeah. of them Khadija al kubra mm -hmm. Now there's another point of view that a lot of people use is that he was illiterate. He did not know how to read nor write. And it, it, sometimes it, it's mentioned in the Quran, Ummi. Mm. Now that word, did he actually know how to read and write? Or was it something you know new to him? It's a great question. If he knows how to read or write, meaning that the Arabs have seen him study at college X or university Y, then they'll say he wrote the Quran or they'll say that professor taught him the Quran. Mm -hmm. When we look in the Quran, one of the ulama gives this opinion and the scholars have had their many discussions, many yes. arguments about the word Ummi. Alama Taba Tabai, when he looks at the word Ummi, which normally in English they translate as illiterate. Yes. 
where a better translation may be untaught. 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 Rather than so that, illiterate. Not, so it's not always negative. Not always negative. Let me explain. Um means what? Um. Um. Mother. Mother. Alama Taba Tabai asked the question. Why would Allah use the word Ummi to talk about the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, mm -hmm. was not known to have read or written? Why use the word Um? Can I guess? Go ahead. From the motherland or from the mother nation or, or no? No. No? Some try to say Um, um as in Um al-Qura. Um Some al try to say yeah. that. No. Okay. No. There is that opinion. You can't deny it. Yeah. But... Allah Tabatwai says, Ummi, your mother is Um, correct? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to feed you or educate you or see you brought up like your mom. She doesn't want anyone to do that except her. Okay. Allah wanted no one to raise the Prophet Muhammad except him. Except my mother does not my God? mother. Uh-huh. When she is my um, she doesn't want to see anyone raise me except her. Yes. When Allah said he is the ummi, he's saying like that mother cannot bear to see anyone raise that child except her. I don't want to see no one teach Muhammad except me. You understood? Therefore, in the same way, the mother nourishes her child. And the mother wants to make sure that she's the one who's bringing up the child. That word Om, you think the mother cares about who raises her child that much? I do not want to see no one educate the Prophet Muhammad except me. Meaning, Ummi means not that the Prophet Muhammad could not read or write. He was not taught by anyone how to read or write except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? No one taught the Prophet Muhammad how to read or write. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who bestows him knowledge. No human being. It's not that the Prophet Muhammad couldn't read or write. He could, but he was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, had the Prophet Muhammad publicly displayed moments of reading and writing, they would have said he wrote the Quran. That's why there are certain incidents where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, he points at the word, but he himself doesn't write. He gets Imam Ali to write. Mm -hmm. When he gets Imam Ali salam, to write, what's he telling us? If he begins to write in front of them, they'll say he wrote the Quran. One of the meanings of Ummi, in the same way the mother cannot bear to see anyone raise her child except her, Allah could not bear to see no one raise Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi except him. Meaning that if there's any knowledge of how to read or write, I'm the one who'll provide it for. No professor, no college, no school. Because in Arabia it was known that there's only a handful of people who know how to read or write. There was no Oxford or Harvard or Cambridge or Yale at the time. Yes? The Arabs, most of their traditions was oral. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a community of readers and writers. Those people were trying to still accuse him, even though they haven't seen him study under anyone. They were still trying to accuse him that he must have studied somewhere abroad and copied their books and came and read. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when it comes to the area of Ummi, it doesn't mean the Prophet Muhammad couldn't read or write. Mm -hmm. He could. But he was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we continue that. It's, it's a huge discussion just on that one word in the Quran. Sure. We can probably continue it. But uh, during the time when the Quran was revealed, there was a lot of persecution going on with the Prophet and, and with the, his companions and what happened to, to, to his followers. How did the Quran help the people back then, the Prophet and his companions? And where did they gather to get the, rev the, the, the revelations and, and, and sort of... Well, they would gather in the house of Arqam and they would gather very, very secretly because, mm. you know, at the beginning, they yeah. had to conceal their faith. Yes. They had to wait a few years before the open proclamation. At the beginning, they had to conceal their faith. And when they had to conceal their faith, the likes of Ammar bin Yasser, the likes of, for example, um, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam, the likes of Abdullah bin Mas'ud and others, very early group of companions, They'd meet, they'd congregate very privately. Mm -hmm. Whenever an ayah of the Quran would be revealed, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would sit with them and he would explain the verse of the Quran to them. Remember we mentioned how Ammar bin Yasir 
returned home one day and his shoulder brushed the idol. And when the idol broke, his mother said, look what you've done. You just killed God. Wow. And then Ammar bin Yasser said, mom, how could you worship a God that dies? When she asked him who told you this, he said the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then she asked him, what else has he told you? He said, Surah Al-Takwir was just revealed. Yes. The female baby will ask on the day of judgment, for what reason was I buried alive? When she heard this, she began to cry. He asks his father, why is mom crying? Because of her sister. It's because her sisters were buried alive. Now, in that early part of when the Quran was being revealed, yes. You couldn't exactly come out publicly. Otherwise, Abu Lahab and your Umm Jamil and Abu Sufyan and Utbah bin Rabi'ah, these guys will be after you and they'll want to destroy you. So what would happen would be that in the early days, it was amongst themselves. As now it became public, while there would have people who would write whatever was being revealed, companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, would write whatever was being revealed. Now, they weren't writing it, listen, they're not writing it using some stunning golden paper we have today or going to some publishing house. You know, you might have to get parchments, wood, skin of animals and, and write on there and keep it amongst yourself. But when it starts to become a bit more public, you find that all of a sudden the persecution begins. Yes. Because you can imagine that this prophet is now going around towards the people and now they can hear him recite that when they walk past his house, they can hear him recite Surat Fussalat, for example, or Hamim, you know, Ta, you know, they can hear all these verses being recited. Yes. As they're hearing these verses being recited, suddenly the antagonism begins. This mm -hmm. man is now changing our people. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of the antagonism, a lot of opposition happened and a lot of people began to persecute, as you mentioned. Now, how did the Arabs take this in? How did they accept it? Oh, they didn't accept it easily at the beginning. Yeah. And Abu Jahl could notice that the words of the Quran were not the words of a normal human being. Exactly. Remember, when a prophet comes with a miracle, that miracle is related to the speciality of the people of the time. Mm -hmm. So when Moses came with magic, there were great magicians in Pharaoh's court. Their sticks with the mercury facing the sunlight would look like a snake is moving. Yeah. Moses' stick became a snake. Finish. Jesus, there were great physicians, doctors in his time of medicine. But when he raises the dead and makes them alive, or when he cures the leper, or when he cures the blind, you're not messing with that. Yes. The Prophet Muhammad's miracle was the Arabic language. The Arabic language? The Arabic of the Quran. Of the Quran. The Arabic of the Quran had now break, broken the laws of prose, poetry, rhythm. The syllable combinations were now destroying what was in front of them. And when this was happening, you can imagine that some of the aristocrats of Meccan society, who were the best poets, were now thinking, what is this? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Abu Jahl saw Walid ibn al-Mughira, Khalid's dad. Khalid, yeah. He saw Walid ibn al-Mughira looking a bit confused. I said to him, Walid, what's wrong with you? You don't seem yourself today. Yes. He said, I heard Muhammad's words, and these aren't the words of a normal human being. And I am the greatest poet in Arabia. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Yes, yeah, Sayyidina, we have a call from, yeah, go ahead. Uh, from Germany. Uh, I was disconnected. Sorry, Sayyidina, yes. Walid al Mughira says, I am the greatest poet in Arabia. And no one can mess with my poetry. Yes. Whatever he's reciting is not the words of a human being. Abu Jahl noticed if Walid ibn al-Mughira becomes a Muslim, That's done. it's over in Mecca. Yeah. Walid ibn al-Mughira, kids everywhere, wealth, slaves, power, looks, oratory, whatever you want in the complete man, barring humility and the love of God. Abu Jahl said to him, are you sure? Are you sure? Because listen, if you admit that Muhammad's words are not the words of a normal human being, you're, not, you're no longer the best poet in Arabia. Sometimes in life, he went there. when the truth is right in front of you, but you're famous, 
it's hard to accept the truth because you feel you'll lose your fame. Yes. Believe you me, there are people out there who know the school of Ahl al-Bayt is the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. They won't accept because of their fame. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sayyidina, can we take this call from sure. uh, Heba from Manin? Salamun alaykum. Sorry, salamun alaykum. If you can just m move away or reduce the volume of uh, the television, please. Hello? Yes, hello, assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidna. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Right, my question is, um, you've said that the, um, the Quran was revealed whole to the Prophet on Laylat al-Qadr in Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't doubt that this is the case. However, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran describes the, some, uh, the actions of some people and events that might occur, and these things could be subjective, so people can change or they can repent or they can, um, you know, turn around. Um, does that mean that they're just predestined to act that way or those events are just predestined to happen um, since they've already been revealed in an ayah? Very good question. Thank sure. you very much. There's two answers to this very good question. Yes. The first one is Allah's foreknowledge of what a person is going to do is in a different dimension to the free will that he is giving these people. Yes. When I have a student in my class and I tell that student, that, listen, if you don't hand in your assignment, you're going to fail. There's an assignment they have to hand in. If they don't hand it in, they're going to fail. Yeah. My student's like, yeah, yeah, sir, don't worry. I'll hand it in. I'll hand it in. What Make sure it? you hand it in. Make sure you hand it in. They don't hand it in. Make sure you hand it in. Oh, I will. I will. When they get to the exam, they haven't handed in that assignment, but they're going to come and do the exam thinking that they'll Pass yes. with flying cars. I know they're gonna fail. But do they fail because of my knowledge or because of their free will? Their free will. Their free will. Just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, knows what's gonna be the destiny of every human being, that knowledge has no effect on the free will. Rather, one may even conclude Allah has knowledge of what will happen to every human being after He had given them the free will to make those decisions. That's number one. Number two. There is knowledge given to certain creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless you have the patience to bear that knowledge, yes. it's not given to you. How many times in the Quran does Khidr remind Musa? You don't have the patience to bear what I'm going to show you. Musa says, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. When he shows him something, it's like, what did you just do? He's like, I told you I have the patience. Okay, I promise I'll have the patience. What did you just do? I told you to have the patience. Then at the end he says, Now I'll tell you what you never had the patience to bear. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, receives knowledge, unlike me and you who would abuse that knowledge, he has the patience to hold it without in any way abusing it. Mm -hmm. Hence why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, I am aware where I put my message. Mm -hmm. Many creations of Allah, but the ones who he gives specific different forms of knowledge, he is aware that when the Prophet Muhammad knows it's not, not going to abuse it, nor is it in any way going to affect him and his actions with those people. There is also a third opinion in theology, which we can discuss on another occasion, as to whether even that knowledge that he's given him, or given to an Imam of Ahlul Bayt is actually wiped away from them at that moment before the incident happens. Ghaybat mm -hmm. al-Muhaddath is something which can be discussed on another occasion. Mm -hmm. Now we have another call from Hamid from New Jersey. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? Are you, Welcome brother? to the show. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. If you allow me quickly, can I just send a quick ziyara, inshallah? Sorry, if you can just raise your voice. Can I uh, do a, send a quick ziyara, inshallah, please? For the ziyara, we we do have a show in the morning for uh, Sayyid uh, with uh, Brother Hussain Sukhna and Muhammad Ali. In a couple of hours, inshallah, you can join them. Uh, but for this show, inshallah. it's uh, uh, general Q uh, for uh, Quran and general Q&A. Uh, so yes, if you do I have, have a, a question, have a we question welcome question your question. too, inshallah, as well. Thank you. If you can join say, uh, Brother Hussain Sukhna in the morning, 
Okay. Uh, that would be great. Uh, He'll be waiting. Yes. Salamun alaikum. So my question is that uh, don't we have some narrations that mention that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would write messages be it to the non-Muslims, be it to the Christians or to the Romans or to the Persians inviting them to Islam? Don't we have such narrations? So can't we uh, say that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew how to read and write and in fact did write letters to other people with his own blessed hands of course don't yeah. we have such narrations and this is my question thank you very much Say here's it. an interesting question and when you're looking at for example these letters there are scribes who work for the prophet muhammad peace be upon his family who are the ones who are writing these letters on his behalf mm -hmm. the hudaybiyah peace treaty and the treaty with the Christians of Najran in Mubahala was, were both written by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. There were other scribes whose roles it was to be involved in writing letters towards the others of other religions, the leaders of other religions or the leaders of other countries as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a person may see the tradition says and the Prophet Muhammad wrote to the Romans. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him wrote to the Romans and his family peace be upon him when he's writing to the Romans doesn't mean he's the one writing. It says the Prophet Muhammad wrote to the Romans means that there's someone who's been employed as a scribe to write these letters. Mm -hmm. Now speaking of writing, who was the exact person that wrote the Quran? Because there are a lot of people who say this person, that person, but who exactly wrote the Quran? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, wrote the Quran under the supervision of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was of those who also was a scribe of the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the two main scribes of the Holy Quran, then without a doubt, it's those two. Mm -hmm. Now, did it look like exactly what we have today? Because we have, you know, if, if we look at the Quran, anyone who opens the Quran would realize there's a Ramadan verse there, and a Ramadan verse there, yeah. and then there's something about the sun there and the moon there. Was it like this that we have today or was it different? The Quran that we have today is exactly the same Quran as was there from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his Exa family. Exactly. If you're looking at, for example, uh, you know, the punctuations and the diacritics and the dots and so on. No, then you have a development in these within the next 100 to 200 years. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, for example, when you're telling me the structure of the Holy Quran, this is the same structure from the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is the man who was taught by the Holy Prophet the exact order of the verses of the Holy Quran. And he's the only one who has the knowledge of the order of every verse as it was revealed. We know that, for example, the first of the verses of the Holy Quran, Surah Iqra, in which surah is that? 96. Mm -hmm. But it's the first surah to be revealed. The man who knows the order of the revelation of the verses is, of course, the father of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, and then all his sons. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have another question from Muhammad Shah. Uh, he says, what about compiling the Quran? The Quran was compiled by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. A lot of people say that it was someone else. Uh, the Quran was compiled in the Shia view by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam under the supervision of the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family during the time of the Holy Prophet's life. Not after. Not after. Our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah have different traditions about, for example, it being compiled either in the time of Abu Bakr or in the time of Umar or, for example, that which is agreed upon is the Codex of Uthman as per what we have today. Yeah. But in terms of true? us, what the agreement on one Codex for the community in the time of Uthman that we agree on in terms of the Quran being compiled. We the Quran was originally compiled in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Of course, the Quran would go towards the lands of Kufa, the lands of Basra, the lands of Cairo, and then Muslims all came together years later upon the agreement on one Codex. However, the Quran that we have is compiled in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. One of the proofs. Mm -hmm. When the Prophet says, I leave behind for you the Quran, how could you leave behind something which hasn't been compiled? Kitab Allah. How could I come? Kitab is also something which is bounded with chapters in order. Everything in order. Yeah, 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 yeah. Secondly, Umar ibn al Khattab, in the famous incident when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, was on his deathbed. And the famous incident known as the calamity of Thursday. Give yes. me a pen and paper. I will write for you. That way you will not go astray. Some will say, does that mean that he can read or write? He will instruct Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib to do mm -hmm. the read, uh, to write. 
And Umar bin Khattab turns around and says, You are delirious. The Quran is enough for us. If there was no Quran present at the time, then why would he say the Quran is enough for mm -hmm. us? We do have a call from uh, Brother Ali from uh, Sweden. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, brother. Salam alaikum, Sayyid Ammar Nafsuwa. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sayyid, my question is the following. Uh, the verse from the Quran 59. It says, Surely we have revealed the reminder and we will most surely be its guardian. So is this only talking about the Quran or is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, even him the reminder? Yes, thank you very much. Surah al Ra'ad, I believe, you. verse yeah. 59. The Quran, the Quran, the Quran, the Quran. Yes. This is clearly in talking about the Quran. Yes. We have revealed, we have sent down the reminder, and we are its protectors. Protect us from a person deleting a verse from a person adding a verse, yes? In the sense that this Qur'an that we have with us today is the same Qur'an that was there from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. There is no doubt that the Holy Prophet Muhammad is a nur, he is a dhikr. Everything that the Qur'an is a guidance for mankind, the walking Qur'an is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of tafsir, you know, and in the dhikr and the hafidhun, there are a lot of people who try to, you know, uh, put anecdotes to the Quran and, and the exegesis of the Quran and everything. How did they know it back then? How did they what, sorry? How did they look at it, the tafsir? How did they do the tafsir? Did they have tafsir back then or no? There is a tafsir when a person comes to do exegesis of the Holy Quran. A person may do tafsir bil ma'thur or tafsir bil ra'i. A person may perform a tafsir of the Holy Quran where they look at the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt on each and every eye of the Holy Quran. You want to know the abrogated and the abrogated. You want to know, for example, the re revelation. You want to know the meanings and the explanations. You want to know the reasons for why this was revealed on this day and that day, Mecca and Medina. Everybody knows that it was with Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. Or a person can start doing tafsir with their own opinions. There were some who now started to give their own tafsir with their own opinions. Some gave a scientific tafsir, some gave a mystic tafsir. We stick to the tafsir of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as mm -hmm. Now we do have uh, a call from Imtiaz uh, from Tanzania. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam brother, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much. Sayyid Omar, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. My question to you is uh, regarding ayah, ayah number seven from Surah Al Imran. Uh, it says, Now, I would like to know what the Rasikhuna is. Who are these? Sure. Chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 7 of the Holy Quran. Yes. Talks of the fact that there are verses which are decisive. Say that we do apologize for one sec. Uh, there is a funeral going on between Haramain. Uh, so the Mawakib procession is going around in honor of that person who passed away uh, uh, of, of that martyr. Uh, so if we you want to continue or you want to wait, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the soul of the martyr who has Inshallah. passed away. Chapter 3, verse 7 of the Holy Quran says. That there are certain verses yes. which are muhkam, some are mutashab. Yes. There are certain verses which are decisive and some which are seen as being metaphorical, analogous, different words which are given. And that those who have knowledge of all of these verses is Allah and those who are endowed with the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This refers to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. The Ahlul Bayt السلام, are the ones who have the knowledge of the ambiguous verses and they have the knowledge of the decisive verses. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family would not have said that I leave behind for you two weighty things, the yes. Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. There is not an eye of the Holy Quran, but the Ahlul Bayt are able to give you every meaning possible or the only meaning possible. <coughs> yes. A muhkam ayah is one where you can only reach a conclusion on one meaning of it. Mutashabih, there may be multiple meanings. You find therefore, that when you come towards the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they have knowledge of every eye of the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. Now Sayyidina, if we can go to a short break uh, and come back, we are running out of time. Uh, time flies by with you Sayyid. Uh, Habibi. You're, you're a time killer. Uh,
So respective viewers, do stay tuned for inshallah after the break. We will get into the general Q&A uh, with Dr. Sayyid Ammar and Naqshawani. Uh, we do apologize for the noises going around in the background. Uh, so do stay tuned for you presented with live footages from inside the two holy shrines. Do take advantage of those times to send your salutations and ask your requests and hajat from these two uh, kings of Karbala. So to the break, we'll be back shortly. Those twelve bright lights who have shone at earth Those twelve whose kindness to hope has given birth Those twelve illustrious stars in the sky of all creation those twelve holy words who are God's compassion translation. Those twelve diamonds whose brightness is for people full of miseries. Those twelve pearls who have been advocates through centuries. باب دوش با کفش وصل دار شب راه می رود چون کوه استوار کوبی قرار اوز آن سوی کاخ ها دنیا به پشت سر در پیش رو خدا یتیم شند مادر کنار شان چشم انتظار مرد یک مرد مهربان یک دست سفرگی پر از تمامان دست افوار مانند سایبان در صورتش تمام الله منجلی است این مرد این امام مولای ما علی در صورتش تمام الله منجلی Respective viewers, welcome back. Uh, the countdown was a bit too early, uh, but yes, we are back live uh, from the Holy City of Karbala. And tonight is, is Thursday night, second Thursday night uh, in Ramadan. It is absolutely beautiful in Karbala. Uh, it's live, the atmosphere is, is, is flourished here. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, what better way to, to spend the second Thursday night of Ramadan in Karbala and with, with the special guest, uh, Sayyid Ammar Rahman. Sayyidna, welcome back. And Thank of you. Course, the birth of Muhammad Hassan al-Islam coming up uh, very soon. Sayyidna, now, we, the discussions that were going on uh, on our Facebook and on our messages, uh, they're all revolving around our topic today. Alhamdulillah, everyone is, is in the Quranic mood, uh, getting close to uh, the mid of, of Ramadan. Uh, so we'll get to answer a bit of general and, and a bit of sure. uh, the questions that are coming up. Now, did the Quran, one of the questions are, did the Quran challenge anyone to prove it wasn't the word of God? How is this a miracle? Yeah, the Quran, the Quran is the only book of the revealed books that are in the world today that challenges people until today. Bring one chapter like, mm -hmm. just one. There are many non-Muslims who speak Arabic, yes. many non-Muslims who are experts in Arabic. Yes. There are professors of the Christian faith who will use the Qur'an when it comes to even the perfection of Arabic grammar. So the Qur'an has always set out this challenge. And would you believe, some of the experts, when it came to the Qur'an, you would find that there were non-Arabs who looked at the profoundity of the language of the Qur'an. You know, your Siba ways, your Raghib al-Asfahanis. You know, these people are, let's say, Persian origin. But when they'd come and look at the words of the Arabic of the Quran, they'd be mesmerized by it. Wow. 
But the Quran has always set out this challenge and the challenge is still there until today. Bring one verse like a verse of the Holy Quran. Many have tried and have failed dramatically. Mm -hmm. Another question that we have, uh, Sayyidina, how can you spot the difference between a Meccan and a Median uh, Surah? Well, there's no exact equation how you could spot the difference between a Meccan and a Medinian Surah. Normally people will look at the beginning of the verse. If the one way, if the beginning of the verse is Ya Ayyuhan Nas, then, then that's Meccan. And if it's the beginning, Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu, because it's a community of believers, that's Medinian. Is that a scale? Or? That is a possible scale. I'm not going to uh -huh. say it's an infallible scale, because uh -huh. I can show actually examples uh, to the contrary. But I would say that's one of the best. When I see Ya Ayyuhan Ladina Amanu, I straight away think this is Medina. This is a, a, a new community of those who are trying to be believers. Uh -huh. Uh, however, we also have to understand that sometimes if the chapter is speaking about, for example, the pillars of religion, you know that's Meccan. You're working on Tawheed against Shirk, working on explaining Nubuwa and Qiyamah, it's Meccan. And if it's, for example, speaking about the laws of the religion, then it's Medina, there's a new Muslim community, Salah, Saum, Hajj, Zakat. But you can't deny that there are many chapters out there which are Meccan revealed with Medinian verses or Medinian revealed with Meccan verses within them. Mm -hmm. Now this person says, uh, Hamid says, Salaamu Alaikum Sayyidina, how uh, uh, has the Quran been altered and what was the concept of Tahrif? <laughs> tahrif, yes, is translated in English language as alteration. Alteration. Tahrif has certainly occurred mm -hmm. in the tafsir and the exegesis of the Holy Quran. Yes. No doubt that there are those who knew there were verses revealed about Ahlul Bayt and they completely changed the reason for the revelation. I'll never forget chapter 2 verse 207 of the Holy Quran. There are those who sell their soul for the pleasure of Allah. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan pays Samara bin Jundub. Yes. Huge money to say that that verse is a prophecy about Abdul Rahman bin Muljam that when he kills Ali ibn Abi Talib, he has sold his soul for the pleasure of Allah. Wow. Whereas that verse is in honor of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, on the night of Hijrah, for Hijrah. example, in the yeah. opinion of some. Yes. That there are those who sell their souls for the pleasure of Allah. That's an opinion. Then there are other verses in honor of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, which were blatantly altered in terms of what? In terms of their reason for revelation and they were given to someone else completely. So is, is the verse altered no, the verse or is the meaning? Altered. The meaning of the verse. Exegesis. Ah, the exegesis of the verse. The tafsir of the verse, the, Quran, the interpretation of the verse, tahrif has taken place. Yes. Someone might say, well, sometimes you Shia have a Quran that's different to us and you have a surah called Surah Al-Wilaya. I ask you, come and look in the Quran that we have. I haven't seen Surah Al-Wilaya. I'll tell you what, I wish there was a surah called Surah Al-Wilaya. It certainly would help in a number of discussions yeah, straight would. out in your yeah. face without the need to have a pure heart to see the path of Ahl al-Bayt But we don't have no surah called Surah Al-Wilaya. Someone says, for example, you may have a verse of the Holy Quran and next to it there's in brackets instead of Ummah a imma. That in brackets is a tafsir of the word Ummah, not an addition to the ayah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have in, in some Qurans, there's a small explanation next to the word. Yes. That's not an addition. It's very interesting that if people want to go in the tahrif debate, where they say that you Shia have altered Suyuti in his itqan, has shown numerous occasions where companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, say that some of the surahs of the Holy Quran were much longer than they are today. But I don't want to touch on that spot. Let's keep peace. It's the holy month of Ramadan. It is. It is. Let's keep peace in that. Uh, now, another question. Uh, when was the Holy Quran compiled? What year? Compiled during the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Mm -hmm. the moment he dies, the compilation is finished. It's finished. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the person to go to, to know the reason of revelation and the order of revelation. Mm -hmm. Another question that we got uh, from uh, Muhammad uh, Ali Hussein, he says, uh, 
there a lot of people ask me about where is Imam Ali mentioned in the Quran explicitly and it's it's a very hard question because he's not are there any verses that have mentioned Imam Ali or point to Imam Ali as you mentioned just earlier right now there's 123,975 prophets who aren't mentioned in the Quran uh -huh. there's hundreds of thousand companions who aren't mentioned only Zaid gets a mention what's interesting is that when there's a verse which doesn't mention a companion but everybody's heard the story they automatically say yeah that's that companion for example the companion of the cave yeah we say the prophet muhammad was in the cave yeah. chapter 9 verse 40 if you do not give him victory we'll help him allah will help him when the disbelievers forced him to leave he was the second of the two in the cave ask anyone who's the second straight away they say abu bakr mm. does Wasn't it say it? abu bakr it doesn't but does everyone believe it's abu bakr yeah. yes does it say his name no no why is it when it's abu bakr on the verse of the cave everybody has to believe allah when it's imam ali ibn Abi talib on a certain verse everybody's like well it's debatable well the tafsir differs those who tell you that they have love of imam ali ibn Abi talib salam, but whenever there's a merit mentioned about him they can't take it know that that person is someone who has not understood the position of Imam Ali ibn Talib and there are other things about them as well. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of verses of the Holy Quran that have been revealed in honor of Imam Ali ibn Talib salam, which he himself, this is very important, says this ayah was revealed about me. Imam Ali ibn Talib, isn't he the voice of truth in Islam? Sunni and Shia I believe? Of course. Is he going to lie by saying that this ayah not. was about me? Of course not. Numerous sermons, he says this is the ayah that was revealed about me on that day, on that afternoon, on that night, on this wow. occasion, on that occasion. And there are many great books which have looked at the manaqib of Imam Ali and the verses that were revealed in his honor. Mm -hmm. Another question that we have, did the Muslims respect the Quran after the Prophet died? They certainly believed in the Quran. Mm -hmm. they, they, went, they went to people who did not have the knowledge of the Quran and nor did they have the knowledge of the interpretation in the Quran and they left the beacon of knowledge that was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib mm -hmm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is the walking Quran he smelt the glory of revelation from when he was a child following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I used to follow him like the child of the she camel follows its mother. Me and Khadija were the third of the three with him. Wow. Used to see the light of revelation and smell its fragrance. And to round it all off on the day of Safin, not only did they abandon Imam Ali, but they placed the Quran on a spear. On spears, yeah. Muawiyah ordered that a number of Qurans were placed on spears. Therefore, did the Muslims respect the Quran the way the Holy Prophet said, hold on to it next to the Ahlul Bayt? Sadly, many neglected the teachings of the Quran and the walking Quran himself. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have Sister Zahra from Iraq uh, on the phone. Salaamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as salam. Salaamu alaykum, Sayyid Ammar. Salaamu alaykum. Um, yes, I can hear you. Um, my question is reg question. Uh, regarding to the yes. Quran. Yes, uh, if you could message your question for tomorrow, inshallah, we have general Q&A uh, throughout the show, inshallah. Uh, so if uh, you can't get through on the line, do send in your question. Uh, now, Sayyidna, uh, another question that we have uh, is, could Jibra'il still give revelations after, to the Ahl Bayt after the Prophet died? Because it's no. a huge discussion. On how the, the moment Prophet the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family dies, yes. revelation ceases. That's it. Is Could Jibra'il speak to non prophets? That's it. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Maryam. Oh, yeah. He communicated with really? her. Yes. Likewise, Jibra'il could speak to the Ahl al Bayt, -salam, to Fatima al Zahra, to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, to the Imams of Ahl al Bayt. Mm -hmm. But Wahi, Wahi ends with the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now we have reached the end of uh, tonight's uh, episode, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, we can, inshallah, continue uh, the discussion tomorrow in the general Q&A. Yeah. &A. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, and we will go uh, through the questions that we have received today uh, and answer them in tomorrow's episode. And do not forget to join uh, my uh, dear brother, uh, Hussein Sukhni and Muhammad Ali, in their show live. Uh, welcome to Karbala, where they give you the opportunity to send your salutations, to request your hajat and everything that you want from the two holy shrines. It's an amazing show. Uh, I do advise you to tune into that. Uh, so, and last day, I'd like to thank Sayyid for joining us thank tonight. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's a blessed night tonight, second night of uh, Ramadan, second night of Thursday of Ramadan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Those twelve bright lights who have shone at earth, those twelve whose kindness to hope has given birth. Those twelve illustrious stars in the sky of all creation. Those twelve holy words who are God's compassion translation. Those twelve diamonds whose brightness is for people full of misery. Those twelve pearls who have been advocates through centuries. Kovne abab dush, pa kafsh vasl dar, shab rah mirabad, chun kuh ostubar, kubi qarar us.